Well, hello everybody. I decided to translate uh, Saturday's um, conference. It was in the uh, city of Puebla and it was in the rural areas and he was talking to the medical personnel um, as well as the people. Um, it was uh, very touching and, and um, uh, I just thought I'd share this one. So I'm going to translate it for you um, to English now. So he's very popular with the people. He's very happy to be with the people in El Seco. And also to be accompanied by people of all this area of uh, Puebla. And I'm very happy to be here and to finish the run of today and this meeting of this weekend. Generally, in general, from it's from Saturday to Sunday, but but today I'm going to make it for two days because tomorrow I'm going to be giving information as to how we're doing in Mexico. I'm going to inform uh, the people regarding what we've advanced in these nine months. The matter, the topic of this visit in this meeting, it's regarding health. And we're going to talk about that. But I want to take advantage to let inform you regarding other matters. I repeat, the central matter is uh, health, but also you and many other people that are listening that wants to know how we're doing. What is the plan? What are you doing? Why are you talking about the fourth transformation? What is that? In general terms, I can say that the fourth transformation means in essence, that we cleanse Mexico of corruption. And they want me to say it fast because I don't speak very fast. <laughs> and what I, the time I spend standing on one foot, and they ask me, What is it that you propose? What is it that you are doing? How are you going to take our uh, country forward? How are you going to take it out of, of this ruin? How are you going to take it out of poverty? These Mexicans say it while you stand on one foot. I am going to end corruption. That is the plan. Me canso ganso, which means if I'm lying, I'm dying. And I come to explain that's, that's the principal problem that there is. That the doctors and that all depends on a very good diagnostician or diagnosis. There's some doctors that uh, they can just look at you and they know what's what's the infirmity that you've got going on. But the most sure thing would be to do some exams, labs, diagnostics, to see what is the illness. It's the same thing. When, when, you, when you want to transform a reality of injustice and uh, pre prejudice, a decadence, a process of degradation, that's progressive, that what produced it, what produced this illness? And I am convinced from a very long time, and especially now, 
that the principal problem of Mexico is corruption. And so therefore, yes, there are other there are problems, grave problems, national ones. But, but I am occupying myself with the principal problem, which is to eradicate the principal problem, which is corruption. Because if you analyze it well, corruption is what has given the transit to everything. It's the principal cause of inequality, social, economical yeah, inequality. And, and what happened is it caused insecurity and violence that we're dealing with now. But because in Mexico, it's it has a lot of riches. It's one of the countries with the most natural resources in the world. Many other countries, Europeans would love, or other continents, would like to have the potential of natural resources that we have here in Mexico. They have uh, ripped us off for years and still we have lots of resources. We have good land, water, uh, forests, jungles, gold, copper, silver, gas, petroleum, a good people that's hardworking. So why? Why this poverty? Why this inequality? Why this back backness? Why this machination? Because of the bad government. Because of corruption. But if we resolve this, it'll get us the rebirth of Mexico. I am sure. And I am um, assuring you that we have a formula to govern, not to cut, not to permit uh, uh, corruption and not to permit privileges in the government. Because you can't have a government that's rich with the people being impoverished, that the government be austeri have austerity, that the, that the uh, workers and government workers learn how to live in the median, that they not have extravagances, luxuries, and that they save the money because what was happening the gov the government that had uh, set up a budget but it was being maintaining the government the budget never got to the people a big part of the government would go to a few hands because they would steal it and the other part was devoted to maintaining, supporting the government. It was per, protect all. The whole budget was to take care of their elevated salaries, to maintain their privileges. And so therefore, what was left for the people of that budget? Very little. So the government was very expensive for the people. It was a government that needed to be supported, that was useless. And now we're ending with corruption from the top to the bottom. That corruption doesn't start at the bottom to the top. It doesn't come from the, from the little towns up towards the palace. No. Corruption, the worst part of it, the most dangerous one, is the one that comes from the top to the bottom. But they used to say, oh, the, but the president doesn't know. The, the president is not informed. He says that's a lie. That is false. The president of Mexico has all the information of everything that's happening. And all the juicy deals, all the uh, illicit, illicit uh, deals were being done by the, in the view of the president, that it was from the bottom. It was a lie. 
Well, possibly he doesn't know about that here somebody in the town, a little minor thing, is is uh, like maybe some local was taking a, a cut. But, but the big juicy deals, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. For example, like if they, like if they sold this uh, dis destroyed um, a place that was worth maybe a fifty million dollar, and they bought it at five hundred million. So four hundred and fifty million over budget, over the actual value. That's just one operation that was of a juicy deal. But that all has to do with the upper um, uh, officials. So, but if it, in the upper part you don't allow these kind of juices, juicy deals, then that's how you sweep the stairs from the top to the bottom. And that's what I can say now, here, with my head held high and looking at you out in the eyes, that corruption on the top has ended. I can't even take my little... <laughs> so he says, I can't even <laughs> wave my little handkerchief and say, no, there's no corruption here on top. And that helps a lot because it saves. How much did they steal? So much. More than you could imagine in everything, in every way. Let's say they made a road that maybe it was 10 million. They would pay 300 or 500 million. So if they made a hospital that might have cost 400 million, they didn't charge. They would charge it in 4,000. That Let me give you an example. When I was chief of governor, they uh, we made a hospital in Iztapalapa. It has 150 beds. It cost us $350 million. A little later, they, they made another hospital with 120 beds in the state of Mexico. Do you know how much they charged? 7,000 million. 20, 000, 20 times more. So when there's corruption, the money and the budget isn't going to go very far. But if there's no corruption, the budget is enough, and you don't even have to raise uh, taxes nor create new taxes. There's no need for it. There's no need for putting it in debt. And also the, the national debt had already grown so much, they didn't even talk about that. But when Fox came, the government... Uh, he left a debt of one billion seven hundred thousand million, like one point seven billion. Calderon increased it to two hundred percent of that, at five billion two hundred thousand million. And Peña left it at ten billion. Not only to pay interest the enormous debt this year we have to destine from our budget we have to 600,000 million just to pay the interest of that terrible debt so if there's no corruption we can finance the development without debt as of now we haven't raised it but I can even say we've lowered it in real terms. I can say that it's going to be diminished because we still need to work on it. Four or five months, no, maybe three months. No, four, by December. But as of now, it's lowered than what we received it but we still have four months. What I am sure of, in my word, that it will not grow. 
in real terms. And then we're preparing our budget for next year, which I will have to turn in the 8th of September. And it is without a debt. Yes, we are not going to contract any debt. We're going to finance the budget with all the savings that we've gotten by not permitting cor corruption and because of the plan of Republican austerity. That means no more luxuries in the government, no more elevated salaries of 700000 a month. That's what the director of Infonavit used to earn, 700000 a month. That is a law that that no one can earn more than the president. And I lowered my salary to half without compensations, and from there down, 108000 So why are we lowering that? We're cutting it from the top in order to raise the salary for the people on the bottom. Why? Because it's growing. The salary minimum, minimum salary has grown more than, than the last 36 years, and it is going to slowly recover their uh, acquisition power. That's the purpose that we have. So we need to adjust on the top to bring it to pay better on the bottom. Like, how, how can you pay 700000 to a high-level official while the public there's people that are working that earn 5000 a month, public officials. The ones that, yeah, like the ones that run the hospital run four or 5000 a month. Or 1800 every two weeks. That's like 3600 a month. Because besides that, it's a contract. So they got rid of all the services, and they privatized everything. And that's ending. We're not going to be exploiting. But with all of that that we have in our budget, we, have, we don't have that presidential airplane. It's on sale. It's for sale in California. It's a airplane that was going to be 700,000 million for thousands of uh, passengers to go to um, in seven uh, hours to, to Europe, that it was offensively luxurious. It's prohibited to use those um, uh, aircraft for hanging out. He says, if I had taken those planes, when would I ever find out the, the, the status of the roads? Never. Even this? I don't like this. Because, yes, I have studied with doctors and nurses. I am very glad to meet them uh, for what they represent. And they're going to continue to help us to push that rheumatoid elephant. Because we got this terrible elephant that we have to push forward so that he can walk. And you've got to help me push that elephant. But I am asking now, Noe, to make a... Uh, some actions for the hospital so that we can, we have made 40, oh, 47, and as of now, but we're doing 80, so we can open it up more to the population. It's important that you're here, that we want to be able to talk with the nurses, the doctors, the workers, but also to the people so that they can know what's happening, so they can be present. Those that want to come, we're not going to force you. We're going to, if you want to come, it's because you come of your own account, your own voluntary. We are saving now. 
There's no more airplanes, helicopters, no more pensions for the ex-presidents. That's why they're a little bit bothered, but that'll get over. They'll get over it. We'll send them a little ice cream cone or some kind of <laughs> a sucker so that they can feel better. The, there's no major presidential state. Do you know how many people were assigned to the elem the president to protection? It was 8,000 people. And so it was more than the Marines, more than the soldiers. That was an elite. And they, now we put them all in the Secretary of Defense and the National Guard to de defend the people, to protect the people because that's their principal job, is security. The people are happy about that. So for transporting, for the local people, for the commercial owners, for the ones that were getting assaulted or, or kidnapped, yes, we're going to be putting order. This place was a disaster. They left the country with a destruction everywhere but we are going to clean it up we're going to clean the country we're going to put it in order democracy is order politics is to put order in chaos and we are going to do it we're going to do the right one not politicking yes we are now gaining a lot of savings and we're going to change things. And now we've already started putting this strategy that we think it helps a lot that there not be violence, there not be thefts, that there not be insecurity, that you attend to the people. Because you are nurses or doctors you know a lot regarding uh, human psychology. You know that the human being is not bad in that, in, as by nature. No, we're not born bad. It's the circumstances, the ones that take you or take some towards the uh, antisocial conduct. So we need to better the circumstances to try to make a better society so that there's work where there's good salaries where you can rescue the fields from uh, abandonment which it finds itself to attend to the youth to help the field workers to give them guarantee of the right to studying the right to work to strengthen the values because we have these in our, in our people, our morals, cultural, spiritual, that they don't continue disintegrating the families because the family is the primary institution of social security that is in our country. It's a treasure that we have. It's not like the family in other countries where they, the kids grow up, and then the parents want them to get out of their house. Not here. Here they grow, and and we don't want them to leave. We even they even abuse. They want to. They stay longer than they should. But that's how we are. It's part of our culture. If one of our family isn't doing well, they go to another family member. And if it wasn't for that cohesive family and family uh, support. It would be a, a hell with this crisis, with the crisis that we've tolerated for all these years. It's a factor to guarantee peace and tranquility and well-being. And it has had this for so many years, so much disintegration of the family. And we need to attend to that, to the youth, that were, that were raised, that many were left without any tutorship, without their parents, without their mothers. That's why the 
trails are full of, of youth. And it grew. It grew like never before, the consumption of drugs. And before, they used to traffic it and sell it. And then in this period of neoliberal politics, they started to distribute the drugs in Mexico. And the commerce of the drugs or the consumption of the drugs for the youth, drug, as you know, of the most damaging that there can be, that destroy. And they hadn't done anything regarding that. The only thing that they did that they've taken forth in politics, public politics, was what the hospitals have in Sakara of the few things that w they've done in all this time of attention to adolescents. So now we have to fortify the values that to take our country forward. And we are now advancing with actions of well-being. We've almen, uh, increased the uh, pension to older adults to double. Now it's universal. Before, they used to only give pension to about half the people, uh, to the ones that are now receiving, maybe four million. And, and they only gave him 1,700 bimenstrual. And now it's everybody, eight million adults, elderly adults. And it's 2,550 double. And also, one million of boys and uh, girls that are disabled get their pension. I can say that today, out of every 10 people in Mexico, 10 homes in Mexico, five get at least one form of support. And in 10 poor homes, eight are now getting some support. And we are continuing to try and get it to all poor homes because for the well of all, we're starting with the poor. Why do I say that out of every 10, they give five? Because they still, if they don't give the 10, they might get the pension for the a disabled child. We are giving 10 million in grants for preschool, primary, secondary, all the students of prep school, all of them, on the first time, their grant, 1,600 bimenstrual, 300,000 grants. In the case of the preparatory schools, it's 4 million of youth. And in the case of the ones that are going to university, of people with uh, little resources are 300,000 that are now getting that money, 2,400 a month. The youth that are not studying, that don't have a job, they're being contracted. Do you know how many now have work as apprentices? And they are paying him 3,600 a month that they get here. That's what they give to 900,000 youth in the program Creating the Future. And they're working as apprentices in shops, uh, com um, commercial places. What is the plan that not a youth, single youth, either have work or education? Next year, we're going to get to and if you can't on 21 to 100% of attention to the uh, youth, 2,600,000 will have permanent jobs. That is the best way to distance them from taking the road to delinquency. It will not be easy for those uh, gangs to try and get those youth 
by pulling them and tricking them in. No, we're going to compete in this area. We're going to take them back away and let leave them be alone. Let's take away the water from the fish. That's the strategy. With well-being, with attention to the youth, we're going to resolve the problem of insecurity and violence. And this has to do with the fields, has to do with planting life, has to do with education. And we've already canceled that poorly named uh, educational reform, and we're going to actually better education. And all these supports are coming in a direct way, and they'll have a card because now we took away that bank of Bienestar. And now of the 217 municipalities in Puebla, there should be branches for the bank in a hundred at the most. And uh, they have 117 that don't have it. But that's also accompanied by something else, that out of the 217 municipalities of Puebla, only 100 can you call by phone with a cell phone. That is to say, there's no internet. There's no telephone service coverage. But in Puebla, which is one of the the most extensive um, territories in the country, like 90% of the territory doesn't have internet, only 10%. That is being backwards. There is a com company, a, the Federal Commission of Electricity is now going to be putting the infrastructure and the cables and the fiber optics in order to take internet to every community of Pueblo and of Mexico. And we're going to communicate all of Puebla with internet. And it will be free internet, hospitals, centers, uh, public plazas, schools. And since we're going to be doing this system of internet, the bank will also put these branches in central areas and the support will be taken directly through this uh, card and they will not be using cash and they will not be getting the money through intermediaries. That is not going to be where, um, hey, I belong to Francisco Villa or Venustiano Carranza or I come, to the, come from this one corporation and give me the money and I'll give it to the people. No, 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 my dear cousin, that's ended. That's come to an end. We're giving it directly to the people now. Because when they went to the organizations, you weren't getting it. Or they would take a cut. They would take their own little piece. And we wanted to come directly to the people. And the same thing with... All, that's why I'm underlining this system, because it is not going to be coming to repay, to repair aulas through the institutions. Now this weekend, they're going to start having assemblies, so that every school, the parents, the parents will form, and the teachers will form a committee, and they will get it directly from the treasury to the. Um, each school so that they can take charge of the maintenance themselves. And all of these are recommendations that the people have told me by themselves. They're the ones that are telling me what to do. You know, when I was going through all the countries, they used to tell me, hey, we want, you're going to win, but when you get into the presidency, don't you send us the money through the government because they're stealing it try please try to give it 
directly to us. So no more. And he says, I will not forget it. So the assessors that told me that, there's a lot of people that told me that. They had a lot of assessors. There's no more <laughs> that ended. Now, imagine that one of your countrymen told me, I was just remembering, in San Quintin, in Baja California, after I finished in one of these meetings, he said to me, Mr. S um, sir, let's go. But listen here. Just like Presidente Juarez stopped before he entered the church, and he said to Caesar, to what belongs to Caesar, it's we need to start repairing, separate the government from the politics, and the government needs to represent all, the rich and the poor, and that's what I'm doing. Now the government is not at the service of the rich, of the minority. Now it's for the, all the people. My boss is the people of Mexico. And that is why we're going to better education. And that, then with this brief introduction, I can enter into the uh, matter of health. We are going to better the system of health. We are going through all the hospitals. And here we are, all the people that need to be there with this plan. And I am telling you that we are going to increase the budget for, for 400 million uh, additional, or 40 million additional. And we're going to destin the 40 million for there not be a, 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 a scarcity of medications in medical units in centers of hospitals, hospitals and centers of medical care, and that they have all the medications, not that certain ones will get the better medications and the ones, another one will get 600, another one 1,200. No, all of them will have all the medications. That they should not have a uh, lack it's simple to apply. Here in this hospital, which is one of the best, they don't have medicine to take care of someone who has a stroke so that he would make it to town. And to save somebody from uh, a stroke, that that's an hour to an hour and a half. So if if he had the medication, he would get there. I'm just giving you an example. So he says, and if it was somebody out in the hills, forget it, in a rural area, he would not live to tell of it. He says, I lived to tell about it because it happened there 10 minutes from the hospital. They took me, they did the intervention, and I came out ahead. And that's why I'm able to tell you about it today. But not just because of the infarct. Uh, it's, it's important to attend to all of them to save lives. That's what you do. That's something to be proud about by the doctors and the nurses. It's the most beautiful thing that there could be. The most sublime. So all these medications, that there not be medications, um, be short of medications. So that guy right here, Calderon, <laughs> is in charge of it. and we'll give you the address to his office. But he won't be in the office much because he has to be out traveling. But So all of you know where his office is. So you can go protest to him there if, if you miss. 
He's the guy in charge. The second part is doctors, specialists, nurses, that there not be a shortage. They're going to have to amplify their turns, their, their uh, shifts. And, and a tabulator. So, he says, so the ones that work out in the rural areas will get higher pay because they're so far away and they don't want to, people don't want to go work in the areas that are too rural or far out. So they don't want to go way out there to Guatemala. There's a total abandonment. And it makes you mad that where the most poverty is, where there's more margination, that's got the worst service. We need to change that. We need to pay them more, to stimulate more, the ones that work in the most rural areas. Because they're working for the poor, for the ones that need it, to give them more support, more guarantees. And the same will happen in the case of violence. If there's a region with a lot of violence, like Buena Vista, in Apachingal, the Tierra Caliente, and there's occupation of 50% in the hospitals. Why? Due to insecurity. The people are afraid to go to that hospital. Not the doctors, but it's the ambience and the insecurity. So if the people don't want to go to the hospital, so what? So do you think that the doctors and the nurses are going to want to go there? That's a complex problem. So we need to attend to everything. But yes, a tabulator that's different. So the ones that work in the most uh, rural areas, they're going to be earning more. And Perez Alejandro is going to be responsible that there not be any uh, lack of doctors and nurses. And the third thing is the maintenance that this hospital is 40 years, more than 40 years old. And I know this system because I was the director of the Institution of Indigenous in uh, Tabasco more than 40 years ago. And that was when they initiated this program, IMSCO Plamar, in 1979. I started in 1977 as the director of INI. It's been 42 years, approximately. I'm not really sure, but somewhere around there. I was an adolescent. I was like a little boy. And I was the delegate for Coplamar in Tabasco. And I used to go to the medical rural units area and the first hospitals that started being built in 79 and 80. And in 1980 in San Carlos in my area, Tabasco, we inaugurated one. But this one was already existing at that time. And we had other programs from the time of Echeverrias, which has more than 40 years. So it needs maintenance. It needs to be amplified. And it needs equipment, like it was said here, to better the equipment. Because we were in Sinaguapa, for example. They don't have uh, x-ray equipment that works. It doesn't work. It's been not working for a long time. And the ambulances, general. So we need to renovate equipment for the hospitals to better the medical units. And that's what architect, uh, architect Carlos Sanchez, he's here with us today. And point number four, that they pacify the workers, 
of the sector of the health. We're going to pacify them. There is no longer going to be eventuals, which is like um, temporary workers. They didn't give them full-time jobs. So this applies to this to all the systems. More than eighty thousand workers that are that are were on contract. The electorals. No, we're going to make them bases or full time so that by the end of the six years all of them should have their full time jobs and we're going to utilize a part of the 40 million of amplification for the budget and that money will be distributed in money and that there not be any uh, shortage of doctors and nurses and the infrastructure for the health centers hospitals and basifying or means full time, making people full time. I expect that in three years we should have a system of health that should be first rate with two areas, attention of health in IMS in ordinary ways and ISTE, which is also very good ISTE, but we're going to better it completely. That's a plan for that. And the system of attention to those that have no social, like open, uh, like IMSS Bienestar. When we started, as we run through this, there was nervousness because they, they thought they thought that we're going to destroy that program. No, we're going to consolidate it. And it's going to be the model that we're going to be using. Because they, they've had two bad things happening with these neoliberals, these corrupts, regarding health. But lots of other things, but two things. But one horrendous that they even stole the medication money because it's not that there wasn't a budget. Do you know how much we destined for 90,000 million was destined for medications? But three companies, the favorite, were selling 70% of the medication. And that's why there's a campaign now that they're saying, no, oh, people are dying because they don't have medications. But all these pharmacies, these coyotes, they used to sell medication. They were, they can say what they, whatever campaign they want. We're not going to take a single step backwards. Corruption's going to end. They've stolen enough already. They're going to stop stealing now. They're going to rest. So therefore, we're going to better the system of health in the whole country and to be thankful for your support and to thank you for your backing and support. Yes, we're all going together, forward. And I will continue to go throughout the country through Puebla, and then I'm going to Calseco, and I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be monitoring. And I will continue to find them. And it was, I was very happy to be here with you today. And we're going to continue to do this. And I, on the 15th of September, we're going to have that yell the, for the ceremony for the independence yell at the Zócalo. And it's going to be a big fiesta like never. And we'll meet there if you want. And I was very happy and hugs. A very... Uh, uh, Viva el seco. Viva Puebla. Viva Puebla, which means long live Puebla. Live the governor of, of Puebla, Miguel Barbosa. Viva Mexico. Viva <laughs> Mexico. So that's the rebel yell. All right.
Anyway, so that was it. Um, that's as far as I'm going with it. Um, but um, I thought it was just, it's just very good to see how the people respond and um, how happy they are and how good he's uh, doing. And he's actually out there every day. And I mean every day. He's going to be out there tomorrow. So today was Saturday. This was Saturday. And he had like three different uh, conven um, they're not conventions, they're conferences. Conferences with the people. He goes out and he meets the people and he greets them and he shakes hands and hugs people and takes their messages from them and listens to their fears and takes documents from them. If they have documentation to show their case, um, they want him to give it, you know, he takes it directly from the people. Um, it is really impressive. I, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. But he is working every single day. Now, one thing I want to say is that he said he's only going to work one term. Now, the term in Mexico is a six-year term. And he says he's going to make 12 out of the six because he works every single day, 16 hours a day. Um, so, in, in essence, it's probably going to be more than 12 years that he's actually worked. Because if you think about it, um, how often did the presidents actually work? You know, most of it was having fun or indulging themselves or traveling or staying in, chillaxing, playing golf, whatever. He's actually working. He's actually out there doing what needs to be done. And he wants to make sure that he gets it all done before his term ends. And so I'm just very impressed with this man, as you can tell. <laughs> um, and um, that's why I'm taking the time to translate, because I want everybody to know. Everybody um, that uh, speaks English, that I can uh, have the honor of translating for. And... Um, I do my best if I make any mistakes and somebody catches it, be sure and tell me because I learn every time. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Bye.